quickly before we get started, make sure you can hear me and see me okay. Let me know in the chat. Say I can hear, I can see. Uh oh. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for that, everybody. Okay, great. So PeopleSoft is the most flexible ERP system in the world. Why? Because they give us the source code. Source code that you and I can modify, we can change. I mean, how cool is that? I mean, our users love it. I mean, the fact that you and I can change anything they ask us to change. They love that until we try to get current, apply maintenance. And at that moment, we have to retrofit all the customizations, don't we? We have to analyze, review them, justify them. We have to test them. And I think that's where they really start saying, oh man, we should not have customized because they have to take time away from the real work to test those customizations. And that's where the greatest strength of PeopleSoft, the source code, the ability to do whatever you want with PeopleSoft also becomes its greatest weakness meaning we've customized so much that um, we maybe perhaps get into what some have termed to be version lock-in. It's just too expensive to get current versus the, the effort required to, versus the benefit you would receive if you were to get current. My name is Jim Marion, and today I want to talk to you about replacing customizations with configurations. Now, when we think of customizations versus configurations, uh, we oftentimes think of this list that I have here of the most common or the most recent additions to people tools. Those would be page and field configurator, event mapping, drop zones, and one of the newer ones, the app engine action plugin. So let me just cover these really quickly uh, with a definition. Uh, then we will review them, actually build some solutions on these. Uh, but I do want to say, you know, we only have one hour together today and a lot of territory to cover. So unfortunately, I can't get into great detail on each of these, but we can certainly uh, get you started, headed in the right direction, and then talk about some of the issues or concerns or things that I think we need to watch out for with each of these. So page and field configurator, what is it? Well, the People Tools team, uh, People Tools and Enterprise Components, and we probably should bring financial supply chain into this as well, they looked at the most common page customizations. They said, what are they? Well, they are hide a field, change a label, set a default value, mark a field as display only. And they said, okay, so if we could make that configurable, for example, give people a page and say, these are all of the fields on this particular page. Would you like to hide this field? Would you like to change its label? Set its default value or mark it as display only. Fantastic. Uh, we'll use Page and Field Configurator to do that. We'll actually, we'll do some of that here in this session. Oh, by the way, also, if you have questions at any time, please feel free to throw those into the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. Um, I do want to allow you to participate uh, and chat is a fantastic way to participate. So Page and Field Configurator, who, who is it designed for? Well, it's designed by the financial supply chain team for functional developers, uh, sorry, functional analysts, not developers, uh, functional analysts to allow them to configure solutions. Oh, why? I mean, well, first off, they know what changes they require. So rather than attempting to communicate to them us as, to us as developers, they can just make the changes themselves. Okay, on to event mapping. What is event mapping? Event mapping is code injection, uh, people code injection. Basically, it allows you and I as developers to inject code into the event mapping cycle, the component event cycle, uh, whether that's component pre-build, post-build, save post-change, field change, or even page activate at runtime. So rather than you and I modifying the Oracle delivered code, we're injecting that code at runtime. Uh, drop zones. Drop zones allow us to add content to Oracle delivered pages. And then App Engine drop zones. Drop zones allow us to add objects, definitions to Oracle delivered pages. We're going to talk about each of these in greater detail, see some examples, and maybe talk about some of the limitations as well. Uh, App Engine Action Plugins, that's a new one as of 858 that allows us to inject people code or SQL into uh, I should say before or after 
a people code or SQL step action in an App Engine program. So the interesting thing on the, the AE action plugins, uh, you, you may know from your experience with App Engines, is that in App Engine, you're only allowed one people code action per step, only one SQL action per step. You can have a do when, a do while, do until, you can have one of each, but only one per step. What if you want two SQLs per step? Oh no, that isn't how it works, right? What do you do then? You do a call section with multiple steps. So in here, you might do a do select call section, multiple steps, SQL one, SQL two, SQL three, and separate steps. Interesting thing about App Engine Action plugins, they allow you to inject as many people code and as many SQLs into any App Engine that already has a people code or a SQL in any order, effectively allowing you to have an infinite number of people codes in one step, uh, infinite number of SQLs in one step. Interesting, huh? Anyway, Oracle has been on this transition from customization to configuration for a very long time. Now, like I said, the list that you see in front of you, the, the list of four are the top four that we talk about today. But if you really wanna talk about what are all of the options available for us to replace customizations with configurations, Oracle has been working on this for at least a decade. I mean, if we look at something like navigation collections, what is that? It's business process-based navigation. They, that one came out in 846, 847, so well over a decade ago. Related content, we'll take a look at some related content as well. Related content, uh, what was that, 85, 851, two? Anyways, at least 10 years ago. So a lot of these features have been around for a very long time, but the ones that we're primarily going to talk about today are what Oracle terms as isolating customizations. I want you to keep that in mind because did you hear how they phrase that? So I said, replacing customizations with configurations because that's what we're going to do. We're going to make some configurations. Oracle calls this isolating customizations. What does that mean? You see, because customization is a dirty word, isn't it? Are these still customizations? Hmm. Let's define a customization. I mean, I don't think we can say whether they're customizations or not without defining a customization. So let's say that you modify Oracle delivered code in Application Designer. Customization? Go ahead, write in the chat. What do you think? Customization? Yeah, totally, right? That's a customization. Deleting a field from an Oracle delivered page, clearly a customization. What about setting an integration, uh, let's go service operation, integration broker, service operation. Let's say you mark it, Oracle delivers them all inactive. Let's say you mark one as active. Is that a customization or a configuration? Okay, now let me ask you this. Let's take, and maybe this has changed recently. So Oracle strategy, if you're on, if you're on the line, please let me know, please correct me. I ran into this over and over again. Let's, say, let's take person basic sync, a very common integration point, delivered inactive, as are all of them. You've got financials, so you want to keep them in sync, so you turn it on. What happens when you apply maintenance? Oracle delivers a new version of the person basic sync message, et cetera. They turn it off, don't they? So to me, a customization is where you modify, change, Oracle delivered metadata that Oracle is going to overwrite. A lot of people like to say app designer, customization, online configuration. I don't think it's that cut and dried. What is app designer? It's a metadata manipulation tool. What do you do with app designer? You open pages and you make changes to pages. What are pages? They're just metadata stored in, in people tools tables. What are, what are translate values? Metadata stored in people tools tables. Integration broker, metadata stored in people tools tables. Page and field configurator, <laughs> see where I'm going with that? I don't think we can just say because we make it here or there, it's a customization versus a configuration. What happened, where, where it's a problem is when Oracle overwrites our changes. Now, a friend of mine did a study. Uh, he did a study of how often does Oracle touch an object? And the answer was, on average, once every two years. Now, if you look historically at Oracle releases, 
uh, back, you know, 909188, et cetera. When did, when did we receive those? Well, wasn't it once every other year? So what does that mean? Oracle touches every definition on every major release. So just about. So once every two years. What about POM images? Oh, we get, what are the three a year? Something like that. So that means that you might have six to eight POM images. So a customization has a life cycle of, say, six to eight POM images if you were to customize an object, because on average, Oracle touches an object once every two years. Once a quarter. Yeah, there you go. So four to eight. Yeah, eight times a year. Um, are messages metadata a question in the chat? The answer is yes. They're stored in the integration broker tables. Uh, so yes, they would be. Services, service operations, messages, et cetera. Okay. So I wanted to kind of categorize real quickly uh, because I don't think that, you know, knowing what tools exist, et cetera, I mean, that's awesome and everything, but in real life, you're going to approach it from what am I trying to accomplish? Am I going to make a page change? Okay, which tool will I use? A page and field configurator, drop zones, related content. Interesting. What are the differences between drop zones and related content? Actually, the lines blur there a bit. So I want to talk about that as well. I'll show you through an example, though. Uh, what if you want to make any code changes to Oracle Delivered Code? Clearly, event mapping is your configuration alternative, or should I say customization isolation alternative. App engines, again, same thing. You only have one option there, and it's going to be your app engine plugins. A question though in chat, are there any reports similar to compare reports that identify the objects that configuration touch so you can flag for testing? There is a, I, I can't remember the adjective used, but there was mention to yesterday uh, of an event mapping SQR report. Now, I think the word used was fancy SQR. You guys help me out there. Have you experienced or seen a fancy SQR? I think that's the first time I've heard that adjective used with SQR. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be with fonts and everything, who knows? Um, but that's one of the challenges we have with configurations is the lack of compare. And why? Because you're not touching the Oracle delivered definition. That's the entire point of a compare report is to identify what are your changes. So the value of isolating customizations is removing them from the Oracle delivered definition so that when you do a compare, you get a same, same, uh, unchanged, no asterisks. Forgive me, uh, those of you that are used to our presentations, I like to use a closed captioning. Uh, so if you see that go awry, let me know. I just realized it wasn't there, so it's there now for you. Um, the, the value of configuration alternatives is that clean compare report. So in a sense, it's, it's um, in a sense, I guess, uh, you don't know. You have no idea that there's a customization to this object or because you've isolated it, you've removed it from the Oracle delivered definition. So you do a compare report and you get same, same, no asterisk or change, change, no asterisk. So how do you identify what to test? That's a fantastic question. I wanna cover that as well. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and let's get into our first example. Let's do page and field configurator. <laughs> <laughs> Just reading there in chat really quickly, getting caught up. Uh, SQR, what? You know, uh, some of the things that I hear people say is, uh, well, hey, wait till we get fancy COBOLs. <laughs> will SQR ever die? Does SQR need to die? Uh, it's sort of like, uh, will COBOL ever die? Does it need to? I don't know. Um, I, I'll have to tell you, I'm, I'm more than, ex I, I'm very happy with all of the financials as COBOLs converted to app engines. Uh, because for me, that's just easier to maintain, but uh, I certainly understand why what's there is there. So let's take a page and field configurator example. Let's go to, let's go to workforce admin, personal information, and modify a person. And what I want to do is I want to hide a field. So let's find somebody, key user, I'll just grab somebody. This is a POM image, standard HCM POM image. This one, by the way, happens to be 858. You probably noticed that when I logged in. Uh, we're also going to take a look at some 859 as well, because I just want to show you some differences between 858 and 859. Um, oh, interesting. The first thing we're going to be doing is page and field configurator. Now, what are the differences in page and field configurator between 858 and 859? Gotcha. Page and field configurator is not people tools. 
So technically speaking, there should be no differences between 858 and 859 as far as page and field configurator is concerned. Page and field configurator is what we call enterprise components. That means it's deployed, delivered with your PUM image, not your tools release. Now, page and field configurator is dependent on tools features. So for example, some of the modern features that we find in page and field configurator as they continue to enhance and improve this product, by the way, it is a living product. They do continue to uh, new features all the time. Uh, I highly encourage you to attend uh, Joe Williver and Kelly Mills sessions. They had one this morning and they have another one tomorrow morning on beginning and advanced page and field configurator. Great, great sessions. Uh, they continue to, to enhance the product. They're taking feedback from us all the time. So be sure to tell them what you think and where you, th you think they can improve as well. Anyway, it isn't people tools, it's enterprise components. So here's our, here's our scenario. A uh, user comes to us as a, as a you know, functional user and says, you know what? We don't record date of death and we don't want people entering values into date of death. It's confusing, it's noise, it's extra. Let's just eliminate the extra confusion from the page, make it go away. So fantastic, that should be relatively easy. New window, let's go to page and field configurator. Now, uh, let's see, that's going to be under enterprise components. So let's find enterprise components, page and field configuration, page and field configurator. Page and field configurator configurations are keyed off component. So personal data is the name of our component. I could find that with a quick J control personal data. And I see there are actually two configurations here already. One is a standard one that I've been working with. The other one is masking. That's interesting. That's an Oracle delivered configuration for data masking. This concerned me a bit when I first saw Oracle delivering page and field configurator configurations, because remember my discussion about metadata, meaning if Oracle delivers metadata, do they own it or do we? Are they going to make changes to it? If I make changes and they make changes, where's the compare report? We don't have metadata compare reports. I mean, we kind of do through, through data migration workbench, but it's not the same. So I talked to product strategy about that. And I said, what are you guys doing? <laughs> this is my territory. I'm supposed to deliver me, the user, the customer. We're supposed to be building page field configurators. You're scaring me because you're delivering them. And if I change yours because I don't want yours, isn't that a customization? And their response was, we're delivering samples, pre-configured configurations for you to extend and use. We're not going to be updating them. That's what they said. So take that uh, for what it is. So, okay, let's go into personal data standard. And uh, let's see, let's go ahead and define our configuration. What do we want to do? We want to keep that in mind, hide the date of death field. So I'm going to go here to select fields. I'll locate the field. Uh, no, notice it says that there are five pages here. Well, biographical details. Let's confirm biographical details. That's the page that I want. So it's already searched. It's already listed the fields on the first page. I'm going to do a view all here so I can see all 36. And rather than using the find that's in the grid, I'm going to use my browser's find. Control F. That's one of the tricks that I use. I'm going to look for date of death. Okay, fantastic. There it is, date of death. And the re this is why I use the browser, because the browser will tell me how many times was the, was the label date of death found? Well, it says it was only found once, one of one times. Okay, fantastic. Why do I point that out? Because there are times where I've searched for a label, because that's you and I as functional users, uh, that's what we have, the date of death. That's all we have to go off is the label. So I've had times where I've come in here and looked at the label text, and I found two, three, four, five matches. Which one is it? We need some way to figure that out, don't we? So I just wanna give you a tip here. What is some way that you can find out? Because if you look, it says the label, that's how, that's page field configurator development team. That was their thought. You and I would search by label because that's what's on the screen. But we need to be able to actually by record and field determine, are we selecting the correct field? Now in our case, we're good, it's one of one. But in that case where you hit two of three, five of 10, I just wanna show you, how would you know? So my first trick as a functional person, because I don't have access to App Designer, this is what I'll do. Inspect, so right click, right click on date, oops, date of death, right click, inspect. And in the HTML, I know I just said functional people in here, I'm showing you HTML and code. Thanks, Jim. Uh, right here in the ID, you'll see it says person, 
DT of death. So the record field all concatenated together. Now, this is not always, this is most of the time, especially in classic. And since 90 plus percent of PeopleSoft is still classic, odds are really high that this is what you'll see when you start doing page and field configurator and you're trying to determine, am I using the correct record field? Person underscore, <clears throat> underscore being the delimiter between the record and the field. So record person field DT of death. Person DT of death. Okay, fantastic. So that's one way. Another way I've seen people use the Chrome plugins. There are two of them out there. Uh, one is updated regularly. The other one, I, I don't think has been updated for five years. I don't remember which is which, but there's PS Chrome and PS Developer Utilities. I'm not uh, endorsing either, uh, meaning I don't know anything about them. I just know they're out there and I know a lot of customers use them. You do your own security and due diligence on those. Uh, but the definitive reference, the way that you and I really, really know as we open the page in App Designer, and this, this, you know, as a functional, you may not have access to that. I would hope that as a functional business analyst who's creating and generating specs and requirements for your dev team, do you have read-only access to App Designer? But here I see date of death, and then it shows me person and DT of death. Fantastic. That's exactly what I needed to know. Confirmed, it is date of death. I'll scroll down here to the bottom say, okay, and then what do I want to do? I want to hide this field. And I'm going to save this, and I'm going to reload this over here. I wanna see, does it take effect right away? Oh, you know what? This is so annoying. Every time you hit the refresh on a component, where does it take you, a classic? Back to the search page, right? So annoying, especially when you're working with page and field configurator, because at least for me, it's a very iterative process where I make changes and come back and hit refresh. So I put together a shortcut for myself. Uh, you'll find this on our blog, blog.jsmpros.com. It's called the refreshable URL. Uh, it's also known as a bookmarklet. So let me find my transaction again. And what it does is it takes the level zero keys as well as whatever page you're viewing. So if you happen to be working with or viewing one of these other pages, it, it uh, moves that into the address bar up here. If somebody else doesn't mind, I know somebody else has that. There's a question chat. Can you put the blog in the chat? Someone else throw that in there for me because I, I know a lot of you. Blog.jsmpros.com. I know a lot of you visit that regularly. Uh, anyways, I'm going to click here and you'll notice that it moves the entire URL into the address bar. So now I can just hit refresh all day long looking at the exact same transaction. Okay, but date of death is still visible. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, so why? And the answer is because it isn't enough to create the configuration. We also have to associate the configuration with a content reference. So this is something that I find to be a bit interesting. I don't know if it's a disconnect or just an implementation detail. Uh, that is that you and I create page and field configurator configurations against components. Now, one component might be attached to a variety of different menus, or in this case, you can see associated with a whole bunch of different what we call content references. What are content references? Well, if I were to go here to Navigator, let's do it over here where we're at least in context. And we can see I've got modify a person. And then if I go to biographical, I also have modify a person. It's the exact same component in a different location in the Navigator. Why? Probably for security reasons. Most likely it's for a menu override. So you and I need to decide of these configurations, to which do they apply? Now, sometimes it's going to be all, sometimes it's going to be some. Now, I'll tell you later, when we talk about event mapping, we get to choose, we can write event mapping. See, page field configured, I didn't tell you this, is actually just configurable event mapping. So with event mapping, we can say, okay, this mapping goes to this content reference, that mapping goes to that content reference. Uh, where they're shared, maybe we create a utility and apply to both. But with page and field configurator, you only get one per component that you apply to whichever content references you want, but you must apply them. What does it do? It configures event mapping through using page and field configurator. So some people ask the question, does page and field configurator write people code? The answer is no. Uh, what it does is create configurations, fields in tables that the page and field configurator boilerplate template code can then iterate over. So it just iterates over the list saying uh, when this field is found in the component buffer record.field.visible equals false, record.field.label equals, record.field. Display only? I don't remember. Anyway. Okay, so let's apply this. I'm actually looking at workforce personal modify. 
that's the one. So we'll click apply configuration. I'll hit refresh. And that's fantastic. The data death field is gone. Now, I want you to notice something because this page is different from other pages, and this is why I picked it. See, a lot of times, and in other sessions, I've done the job data component, and we hid the currency and the currency code because some people could consider currency or your pay rate to be the, the confidential um, information that you should protect. And when we hide those fields, PeopleSoft just leaves a gap. But look at this page, the gap is gone. Why is that? So biographical information, if we look back here at the page, you'll notice that biographical information is in a group box. And let's just look at the use tab properties. Um, where is it? Adjust layout for hidden fields, there it is. There is an adjust label layout for hidden fields checkbox so that the group box is actually expanding and contracting to hide those hidden fields. That's fantastic. I love that. Uh, otherwise, what we see, and you'll see, you'll find this on a lot of classic pages, is when you hide the field, you just have an empty space and it just feels weird. Uh, so what in Fluid, of course, is totally different. A uh, key difference between Fluid and Classic is, uh, you see the liquid in the jar, this is why they call it Fluid. Uh, the liquid has this shape in the jar. If we change the shape of the jar, the contents changes to fit the shape of the jar. Uh, that's how fluid works. So if you change the contents or change the shape of the jar, the content reflows just like liquid. Change the amount of liquid in here, change the shape of the jar, you change the shape of the page. A classic isn't that way. Classic would be like if I added some sort of a, something in here to solidify this, and then I flipped it, it would still stay up here, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's classic. Uh, anyways, I wanna go on, I wanna, I wanna look at a couple more ideas here. So the, uh, let's take date of birth here. Uh, it'd be very common to want to mask date of birth. I mean, uh, actually, let's go back here and let's look at masking profiles. So return to search and let's grab the masking profile. I have one here to mask the, it's not applied. That's why you don't see it. It masks the age in years and a part, full mask and a partial mask on birth date to just mask the years section. And you can see here in the user list, I say mask for everybody except the HR administrator. I happen to be logged in as an HR administrator. So we're seeing the full thing here, but masking would be very common here uh, to mask how old they are. The, the, um, but this one here, first question is, you know, let's, let's do the same things we did before. Let's figure out if we want to apply masking uh, using page and field configurator, what field is this? So we'll do an inspect and we can see it's person underscore birth, birth date. Uh, that's fantastic. That makes sense. So that's exactly what I would expect. Uh, so, but let's go here to App Designer because I just want to prove that out. So what if we open date of birth here? We want to do some masking and we see HCSCM mask DOB. What? What? Okay, wait a minute. Page of field configurator. Let's go back here to masking. Uh, we're masking person birth date. Fantastic. Just like I said, what is this? You know what? I'm going to modify this. I won't save. Remind me that. Don't save. Behind that is the date of birth. So there's actually a masking overlay over the top of the date of birth field. Okay, wait a minute. So why? Why? So th this one, this one's been a little bit of a challenge for me, and it's I think it's a challenge for all of us. It's something that we need to consider what tool to use. So today for data masking, we have event mapping record dot field dot set display mask. We have page and field configurator, which we just talked about. We see con configuration right here. We have application specific configurations. That's what we just hit. I mean, you can still use page field configurator. It would work just fine. But I point this one out specifically because the apps teams are building their own data masking configurations. I'm not an app expert. I don't anticipate that many developers are. So we're heavily dependent on our functional users to stay current on those, identify them, and then make the decisions. Do we want to use the application specific configurations or do we want to go with something like page and field configurator or event mapping? Uh, why choose application specific over the alternatives? Well, the answer is because the 
application specific may identify a particular piece of information that's used throughout the application. And rather than you creating a configuration on every single page, you apply it once and the apps teams carry that forward through their application specific configuration, something to keep in mind. We have one more for masking and that is the data privacy framework, which is actually enterprise components, not people tools with a twist. The value of data privacy framework over all of the other options is query masking. So right now, for example, we're masking years, but we're if we were, we would only be masking year and on this page specifically. If we went with the application specific setting, it would be masking across the entire application, wherever that field is used, according to the way the apps teams defined it. If we use the data privacy framework, it would mask across all pages and query defined by role. So you might say that particular roles are allowed to see it, whereas others aren't. Anyway, do you see how that can get confusing? Because we have a lot of tools that overlap. And then it's on us to choose, okay, which one's the best one? And even better to know that those options exist. Okay, I wanna do one more thing here before we move on. And that is, I want to, the national ID down here. Okay, it'd be obvious, right? Let's mask that. Uh, I've got another idea. Let's get rid of it. Actually, hold on. Yeah, let's try that. Let's get rid of it. So what is this? Uh, national ID, I'm guessing that's a group box. I'm guessing it's a, maybe a collapsible data area. I don't know. Probably have to do some investigation into App Designer to figure it out. Uh, we could also go back to Page Appeal Configurator and look. Uh, before we do that though, while we're on Page Appeal Configurator, I was talking about the user list. I do have, sorry, I'm gonna jump back here for a minute. I do have one thing I wanna point out here on the user list tab. Notice the, I, I guess we might say the important noun there that is user, user list. So a lot of these configurations, you can apply changes, say, meaning this change applies to this specific subset of users or these particular users, uh, whether it's criteria from the component buffer, whether it is configuration to hide, show, mask, et cetera. But I specifically want to point out users. I don't like this. I don't like that you can make configurations based off users. I mean, on the one hand, it's fantastic because it's so easy to say, oh yeah, that person over there, they're the one, they're supposed to get access, these others don't. You can list their names right now, today. The problem is that that is right now, today. Tomorrow, those names are going to change. I don't wanna come through all my page and field configurator configurations and update my users regularly because the users are shifting around in the organization. Who does this job? Who does that job? Now they've switched or they promoted, they've, left, someone else has come in. That's why we have roles. I, I, this is one of those things I wish they didn't have. I wish they didn't allow for excluded users. Maybe there's a use case for it. If there is, let me know. Maybe I'll, I'll change my position. But you're already managing user role membership. You have to. You've got dynamic role roles. Why force yourself to manage rules also? Why not just use roles everywhere you can? Now, sometimes you have to think a little bit harder about how would you model that using a role, but I will every time use roles. No users. Uh, here's a question. What if you have a user who has the power to modify their role? Irrelevant. That's fine. I mean, it's, it's not a security issue. That's not what I'm concerned about. Uh, my challenge is that sooner or later, that user has a, the power, like for example, as developers or administrators, uh, they change their roles, but they're not going to be in that job forever, are they? Maybe they will. I don't know. I don't want to count on that, though. I don't want to be changing the configurations. It has nothing to do with the uh, segregation of duties and security. It has everything to do with having to manage that metadata going forward. I just don't want to have to go back and visit these rules every time we change users in particular positions and locations. Uh, okay, so back to hiding this national ID right here. So let's figure out what is it. So we have the page open in App Designer already. And I can see national ID down here. Oh, it's a collapsible data region. It's a grid. Good to know. Good to know. So if we go to the use met label, where is it? Somewhere in here. One of these. There it is. Collapsible data area. <laughs> There's a checkbox. Collapsible data area. Okay, so it is currently expanded, but it is collapsible. The main reason I wanted to point this out is because we can't configure this from page and field configurator. So a common question, 
is uh, when should we use event mapping and when should we use page and field configurator? Because there's an incredible amount of overlap. Why? Because page and field configurator is event mapping. It's, it's, it's a framework built on top of event mapping. Event mapping is what makes page and field configurator possible. That's why page and field configurator has a baseline 855 tools release minimum when event mapping was released. So when do you use page field configurator? When do you use event mapping? Well, the basic rule is page and field configurator every time you can. Event mapping when you can't. And this is one of those when you can't. So let's, let's use this as an opportunity to move into event mapping. And for that, because I know a lot of you have already seen event mapping in 858, 855, it didn't really change much other than each iteration added new events. But I want to show you this one specifically in 859 because 859 is a significant rewrite of event mapping. Forgive me, uh, the event mapping itself didn't change. What changes the way that you and I configure event mapping? So let's do this. Let's go down to, let's find people tools. <laughs> In the alphabetically sorted nav bar navigator, we'll talk about that more tomorrow in our session, Dave Bain and I with 859, talking about some of the changes coming in the UX for 859, good, bad, ugly, better, etc. cetera. We'll, we'll talk about all of it. And so people tools and portal. Now we used to go to people tools portal related content service, manage related content service, but today we go to people tools portal event mapping. And then the event mapping configuration, which gives us, you might call it an activity guide for event mapping. You know what? I'm going to call it an activity guide. You know why? Because if I look at the URL here, it says PTAG start page new. You know what that is? People tools, activity guide, start page, new user interface, which was the internal code name for Fluid. Uh, so yes, it is in fact an activity guide, but those of you also might recognize it as a navigation collection from the SC name here, shortcut collection name. So it's actually a navigation collection published using Tile Wizard. A question, can we add configuration for page field configurator to a component? Um, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Uh, if the question is, can you use page field configurator to configure page field configurator? The answer is yes. Uh, Joe Williver was the first one to bring that up to me. He's like, hey, I've done this. Uh, great idea, Joe. Uh, maybe perhaps you want to hide the event mapping tab so that your functional people can go and create the configurations, but they have to pass through some sort of a, an approval process, and then someone else goes in and clicks the button. Oh, yes, and you could use it to hide the user list. Oh, actually, hold on. Um, yes, you can use it on page field configurator to hide particular items, but can you hide the user list? Now, if it's a drop down list item, you might have to use event mapping to remove items from the drop down list uh, as far as people come, because you can't use page and field configurator to determine what shows up in a list, but you can use people code to do that. Good question. Uh, how about a new window? Let's open the transaction, the system under test, what it is that we want to review. So, navigator, let's see, event mapping configuration. Uh, yeah, right. Sorry. Workforce admin. This is alphabetical, by the way. That means I have to go down to P. I'm used to being at the top. Personal information, modify a person. Jim, why don't you just do you search? Why not just do that? We'll talk about that tomorrow in the 859 session, 859 UX. So let's look for the same one. Cash. Okay, great. So this is it, national ID. I want to hide the national ID section. So here's what we'll do. We'll create an event mapping. Now, right here, you notice it says configure event mapping, and over here it says event mapping services. So before we can configure, I actually think these steps are reversed. Before you can configure, you have to first define a service. So in the past, we would have gone to related content, define related content service, manage related content service. This is the exact same thing, just simplified specifically for event mapping. I love that. I love that new feature in 859. So what we need to do here is add a service ID. So let's see, RCDD, reconnect, dive deep. Uh, let's see, it is personal data, personal data, hide an ID, hide the national identifier. I like that, service ID, service name, hide national ID. Good description, huh. I don't know, how about hide national ID? <laughs> Now we need an application package and path in class for that. So that of course is going to be application designer. So I'll create a new application package here. 
We'll give it a name. How about RCDD uh, personal data hide? Oh, actually, I got a better idea. That's the purpose, isn't it? But one of the challenges we have with event mapping is identifying where it's used. I mean, this is a, um, what do you say, fancy SQR report for event mapping that'll show us. Uh, but I don't, you know, what I want to know is from a project what components are using event mapping, whether a component uses event mapping or is irrelevant until lifecycle management. That's when it becomes an issue. What do I need to test? Anyway, let's grab the component name. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to grab it from the URL. Shame on me. Don't do that. It might not match the real component name. And then I want to determine, okay, into which component do I want to, or what object do I want to apply this? So I'm going to basically model the event structure. So a quick control J here. I'm going to pick the page name. The page is personal data one. And then I'm going to use page activate to, of all things, modify the component buffer. Shame on me. You should not be modifying the component buffer from page activate because component buffer is component specific. Page activate is per page, meaning you would be changing that every time you switch back and forth. Why am I doing it from page activate rather than from a component buffer event? The answer is because page activate is the absolute last load event to trigger. Guaranteed, I'm going to override whatever Oracle's doing every single time on page activate. That's why. Is it the right event here? Maybe not. Maybe not, but it works. <laughs> so now I'm going to go to, oh, now we need to write some people code. Every event mapping people code looks exactly the same. So I'm going to go to our GitHub repository where we have a series of people code templates. I know you want this, so I'll go ahead and share this in the chat. And I'll grab the event mapping template here, just copy paste. And then all we need to do is write the code. And that fortunately, let's let's open the component or the, the page. Uh, open page personal data one. That's the page name. I just happened to remember from when we looked at it earlier. And down here, you'll notice national ID. So what's the record, main record, PERS NID, page field name, PERS NID. Is that true? Is that the main record? It might be. How do you know? Let's open the component. So what I need to do is get a pointer to the scroll area and then invoke just the hide all rows method. So let's look at the structure. <laughs> Big component, sorry. Uh, oh, I see other people are probably handling some of the questions in chat. Uh, how do we migrate these from dev to test to prod? I'm hoping that you answered that uh, through data migration workbench and people app designer projects. Both of those are options. Uh, let's see, let's go to, you know what? This is gonna be challenging because it's such a large component to find the level one, but it's going to be a level one. Uh, anyway, uh, wait, I see it, PERS NID. PERS NID, that's the one. It says primary record PERS NID. If we look at the page, we go to the order tab and we look at the scroll area, we can look at the fields. Uh, oops, this is it right here, the grid. PERS NID. So it's gonna be the first real record, first real field in the grid that is not derived work, not related to display. First real record, that's gonna be the primary record. Okay, so now we know it's PERS NID. Back to our people code. And we can say get row set scroll dot hide all rows. Since we're at page activate, we're talking about a level one row set and we're already at level zero because you're always at level zero. We don't have to put get level zero in front here. Of course you're at level zero. Uh, you're a page activate, pre-build, post-build, you're always at level zero. So we can just say, can you give me, give me that level one row set and then hide all rows. Fantastic, back here online, let's complete our configuration. So this is called RCDD something. Wait for the handy type ahead, fantastic. The path is, in this case, I chose the name of the page because that's the object to which I'm applying related con or event mapping. And page activate and, now somewhere on this page there's a save button. Do you see it? There it is. <laughs> the double, the double, 
the double scroll bar has me on that one. I think people tools development should come back to this one. And I think they should do either sticky header or sticky footer uh, so that that save button is visible. Uh, okay, so that's done. Next step in this, so this that's one difference from 858 and earlier. 859 now has the simplified page for defining the service. You still have to define the service. You still have to migrate the service. Uh, okay, now we want to uh, add a configuration. Personal data is not here. So I'll click the add configuration button and I'm going to search for a com content reference. So uh, personal data, wait, and Elasticsearch returns results. Did you hear that? Elasticsearch returns results. I want to point this out because this is a key difference between 858 earlier and 859 and later. 859 and later allows you to configure event mapping on any component that already has event mapping. Probably not if you're at Oracle delivered. There shouldn't be any other than some of the page field configurator configurations. What if you want to add your own? That's what we're doing here. You must implement Elasticsearch. As of 859, you have to have Elasticsearch to identify components to perform event mapping. If you do not, then when you come here, it's going to say that the whatever the portal registry index name has not been deployed. Deploy first and then come back here. I don't know if that was intentional oversight. We don't know yet. I'm, we're on 85904 here. 859 is still new. Maybe that's the future direction. We don't know yet. We're still waiting for tools to uh, let us know what their thought is on that. Anyways, personal data, that's what I typed in. So let's find... Man, which one is it? Probably not personal data hidden. Oh my goodness, look at how long this is. We're looking for the workforce admin personal data one, I think. <laughs> I did not know how large this list was going to be. You know, it'd be so cool is if I could just use the navigator to identify it. Oh, that would be just like 858, wouldn't it? Hmm. Did I type it right? It's modify a person. Oh, goodness. See? Modify a person. There it is. Workforce administration, modify a person. Did somebody write that in the chat for me? Yeah, see, uh, somebody put in chat, one of my favorite new components, find object navigation as part of enterprise components. Uh, enterprise components, find object navigation. That's not going to help you here because we have to find it in the portal registry um, index, elastic search index, not the navigator. Okay, so what event do I want to map to? I'm going to map to page activate of which page, it's going to be the personal data one page. Oh. Didn't I say page activate? Cancel. Oh, did you see that? Did you see that? I chose page activate. I did. It says record. Watch the replay. Kind of an interesting quirk I found. I have to click it twice. Personal data one. And then service ID. Uh, that was RCDD. And let's go with post, meaning our code will run after Oracle's code. Uh, none of the rest matters. Event mapping parameter sequence number doesn't matter. Uh, some people have asked, you know, can you drill into records from sub pages, et cetera, as of 859? The answer is still no. Uh, it's been that way since 855 since release. It's basically a SQL issue being able to identify these records that are attached to sub pages of a page within a component. Our workaround is to click unrestricted prompt and then select the records. Uh, let's see, let's save this. And if I did it right, when we, oh, oh, I don't have my refreshable URL here, do I? Well, interest of time, we've got about 10 minutes left. What we're hoping to see is that the national identifier is now gone. Fantastic, it is, it's eliminated. Eliminated for everybody. But in real life with my event mapping, I would probably add some is user in role type criteria here. Uh, something so that some people see it, some don't. Uh, I think, 
I think somebody was noting control and maybe to find the save button. Or maybe they're maybe they're just trying to get out of the conference. <laughs> control end. We're done. <laughs> okay. Anyway, sorry, I'm laughing at my own jokes. How terrible is that? Uh, so we have a few minutes left. And uh, so I want to cover drop zones and I want to cover related content. Now we don't have time for me to build out a drop zone solution here in the session. I don't know. Uh, we'll see with about nine minutes left. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to show you some pre-configured drop zone and related content information, and then we can just discuss about it, discuss it. Uh, so, oh. okay, so let's start with related content. So I'm going to go to workforce admin, job information, and job data. Uh, it appears that people were laughing harder at me laughing at myself than they were at my jokes. Uh, <laughs> 901. Uh, let me grab a user here, and I can see this user exists in the system. Uh, they have, wait for it, this user has been terminated. Okay, so what does that mean? That means this is not the first row. How many rows are we seeing here? One row. Okay, you don't terminate somebody before you hire them. So there's obviously some history rows here, but I can't see them, and I have no idea how they relate one to another. Now, I could, of course, choose include history, and then I can see, aha, there are 21 rows here, but then again, how do they relate to one another? Okay, so clearly on December 31st, 1999, Roberta Jordan terminated uh, for some particular reason. What preceded that? What were the promotions? What were the raises? What was the higher date? What was the, the uh, Roberta's tenure? I have no idea. I could scroll through all of this and try to put it together, but I got to thinking about it and this came up um, a few years ago as I was sitting in an open world session, thinking about data visualizations and what data, where. Where's the value for me as a functional user? What data do I want to visualize? And it occurred to me that anything that's effective data, I wanna see the history of that effective dating. So this is related content. I wanna show you my job action history or this employee's job action history in a timeline. Now, if you're curious, you wanna know how to build this timeline, you know, I can see the higher to the end there, how to publish it and make it available as related content. We have that on our YouTube channel. Uh, one of the first videos we posted probably about two years ago. Uh, we've covered it many times since then in our one day continuing education events. And of course, we'll be seeing it. Again. Oh, actually, you know what? Um, we covered it as a drop zone as well in the fluid job data in our developer day webinar that we had in August. So I encourage you to find the replay for that as well. Anyway, this is related content. The value of related content is you can put anything, anything you want into classic related content. And in this case, it's related to the level zero keys. It just has to be related to some data on the component anywhere with classic. This can be external content coming from another system. In my case, it's just a, what we call a PeopleSoft iScript using the Oracle Jet timeline visualization. Uh, Oracle Jet is a JavaScript library that is delivered with people tools. It's already there. It's the same charting library that, that pivot grids use and other people code charting uses. I want to contrast this related content in classic because like I said, you can put anything you want to where usually at the bottom or sometimes on the right hand side of the screen. I want to contrast that with fluid related content because I find fluid related content to be much more limited. Well, the fact is it is limited, whereas classic is unlimited. Put whatever you want to in it. Fluid related content is limited to tiles that render on the right hand side of the screen that target fluid components. Now my timeline is not a component, definitely not a fluid component. It's just HTML, JavaScript and CSS using some SQL to get the data. But for the fluid framework to be able to load these tiles into a modal dialogue, they must target fluid components. So the fluid related content framework is much more limited. Now it still has value, as we can see here, Oracle has delivered a lot of fluid related content. Okay, now let's compare and contrast that with drop zones. Now, drop zones allow you and I to add content to any Oracle delivered page, so long as Oracle has first added a placeholder. That's a key difference between page field configuring and event mapping. Page and field configuring and event mapping, you can use against any component, regardless. Drop zones, first Oracle has to add a placeholder. Oh, related content, anything, anywhere, anytime. Drop zones, only when Oracle adds a placeholder. What we're finding is that Oracle usually adds placeholders at the top and the bottom 
of fluid components. What about classic? As of 858, classic supports drop zones. And again, we're finding, and with talking to product strategy, they are giving us drop zones on classic set of pages that are not intended to, that they're not planning to upgrade to classic or the duration, the timeout before <laughs> upgraded fluid or the timeout before they upgraded fluid is so far out that they're just giving them to us in classic now. Great example of that is where are the job data classic drop zones? There aren't any. Why? Because they've given us job data fluid, which is absolutely littered with drop zones. What another difference between related content and drop zones? Related content is an entirely separate component buffer from the transaction. Two totally different. You save one has absolutely no impact on the related content. Save here, no impact on the transaction. Drop zones become part of the component buffer. Key difference. So save post change at the component affects everything in the drop zone as well. So what would the same thing, the, the chart across the bottom, the timeline, what would that look like on fluid job data? So let's see, I want to go to workforce admin, manage human resources, and then manage job. And I have, this is, this is the start of the, this is the configurable search for fluid job data. Configurable meaning that you as, as the functional experts can go in and configure what fields show, et cetera. I can see my search history. Actually, I think this is really cool. I'm going to find KUL0901. And what I've done is used the drop zones that are in this search page. Remember, this is fluid. If I were using fluid related content, I would get a tiny little timeline graphic showing up here on the sidebar. But I said, no, I want to see the whole timeline. And even better, we decided to make them drillable because one of the things that we found here is that fluid job data makes extensive use of the URL. So I can add the effective dated row information to the link here. And you can see it's loading up, return from disability row, 1987, return from disability. I think that's just absolutely amazing. Uh, the flexibility, the power, what you can do with these configuration alternatives to customizations. So anyway, I started out at the beginning and I said, um, customizations, configurations, what are we, I mean, here we've been talking about what we call quote configurations, but Oracle calls these isolating customizations. And so I kind of have to ask the question, why? Have we really eliminated customizations? I don't think so. They still exist. They're still customizations. Let's, uh, let, me, let, me, uh, let me explain that. Let's go back to hiding the field. So we hide the date, date of death. Uh, is there an issue there? Meaning, if if Oracle makes changes to the component, uh, do I need to reapply my quote customization? Well, the answer is no, I don't have to reapply. Is it gonna show up in a compare report? No, because I haven't changed anything Oracle delivered. I have my isolated customization sitting off to the side. But do I need to evaluate to see if it's still relevant? Probably. Do I need to evaluate to see if I need to retrofit or make other changes to my configuration to make it work properly in the new solution? Probably. Has Oracle made changes to the component that would render my, that actually would break my solution? Maybe, because what's happening behind the scenes? Record.field.visible equals false. So the page and field configure a configuration as it is today. If we were to take this after an upgrade where Oracle removes that field, it would fail. Where's the compare report? There isn't. Fortunate with page and field configurator, and this is another reason we recommend page and field configurator, is in, a, let's see, in the interest of time, I won't go there. There's a validate configurations button you can check, and it will confirm that your configurations are still valid, that the component buffer is still the same. Uh, that's good. That's good. But it does beg the question how are we going to test these things? Now, we're out of time, so I can't show you. Uh, I had planned on it, that's why I have PTF here. But what I do, let me just show you one that I created. Uh, let's see. Yeah, date of death, verify date of death. So here's an example PTF test case. What does it do? It logs in, it goes directly to the personal data, identifies KU001. It says person date of death not exist. If it's still hidden, it passes green light. If something has changed and now the field is no longer hidden, it would fail. Now, even better, if Oracle has made changes that invalidate my configuration, the test will fail also. It's going to throw an error message and, 
and the message recognition isn't going to find it. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways that this could fail. That's good news. It's not that I have to refactor my test, maybe I do, but it's pointing out to me from my regression test library, all of the configurations I need to review. Anyway, we are completely out of time. Uh, let me see. It looks like the people in the who joined the conference, uh, smart people, have answered a lot of questions for me. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, I do want to make you aware of a couple of things. Oh, I got to do that before you leave. One is we have a configuration day webinar coming up here on uh, November 18th. I want to offer you a 10% discount off of that one day continuing education event. Uh, so uh, well, let me write that into chat as well, the URL. It is cd21. Okay, that's the that's where you go to find details and register. Uh, with that, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple more sessions coming up. I've got one here that starts in about uh, 14 minutes, uh, which is people, tools, tips, and techniques. So I look forward to seeing you at that one, as well as an 859 session tomorrow morning on the UX changes for 859. All right, you guys, have a fantastic conference. I look forward to seeing you at the next one. Bye now.